Um, okay, so last Thursday we did rotation matrices and transforms. And today we're going to sort of take the same kind of approach where we first do the rotational part and then add translations in. Um, so uh, up to this point, we haven't actually talked about uh, all the different types of possible representations of rotation. We only talked about rotation matrices. But um, it's actually possible to express uh, rotations in a much more concise form. So for example, using uh, Euler angles, uh, or roll pitch yaw is what they're also called. Um, so those are, those are three numbers to describe any rotation. Uh, however, there are some issues with that. And th the main issue is that you get these uh, singularities, which means that the uh, description of a certain um, yeah, part of all of the, 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 the space of rotations is not as good as other parts. Like, um, and, and you will always get that with, with three numbers when you express a rotation with three numbers. Um, so a rotation matrix solves that by being highly redundant. So you have nine numbers, a three by three matrix, to describe any rotation. So really you have six too many. So uh, you actually have six constraints on that rotation matrix. So, so if, you, um, if you recall from, from uh, Thursday, like the, the thing that um, that makes a rotation matrix a rotation matrix is that uh, R transpose R is the identity. So uh, really what this does is, is impose six constraints on this rotation matrix. Okay. <coughs> so, um, so first we'll, we'll look at those constraints and see well, let me first start with this. So uh, you have you have this rotation matrix R. How would you describe uh, rotational velocity? Mathematically, mm -hmm. the change in R, like the yeah. time derivative. Okay. So so suppose we have we have these two two frames. Uh, J. We're trying to express the, uh, the, the rate of change of rotation of I with respect to J. Well, what we, what we can do is just take the rotation matrix R I with respect to J and just take its derivative. Uh, but the problem with that is that, um, remember, this, this matrix is highly constrained. So, um, you have a, a, a three by three matrix with six additional constraints, and just just using the uh, the rotation matrix derivative uh, will give you another nine numbers. But uh, it's actually it turns out not to be necessary to describe that with nine numbers because when you're talking about velocities, um, singularities are not really a, a problem because because uh, velocities are always sort of a local thing. So you you take a look at your current rotation, and then you look like a very, very small time step, step ahead in time. Uh, so there, there must have been only a small change in rotation also, unless um, you're rotating discontinuously or something. Um, so, so it's al always, um, there's always gonna be a, a small change in rotation, which means that you can just do a local um, representation, and that, that's good enough, you don't need to add more numbers and then constraints in order to uh, have a globally valid representation of orientation. Um, so, so the way this works, the way you can uh, look at those constraints um, is uh, just write down. Uh, let me get the order right. Okay. So we have our identity R by J. R J I is I, so that's that's just the R transpose R equals I thing. So 
remember that, that if you uh, if you have the J here and the J here, they sort of cancel out, and you get the rotation from I to I, which is identity. So if you rotate uh, to a frame and back, then you arrive at the same frame. And now what we can do is uh, actually take the derivative of this whole equation, uh, and that ends up being with the product rule, uh, R I J, R J I dot plus R I J dot R J I is, or what's the uh, derivative of the identity matrix? Zero. <coughs> so that's kind of cool. Uh, so let's let's call this matrix. So this is just a three by three matrix, S. Uh, now let's take let's just uh, bear with me. Let's take the transpose of S. S transpose is what? How would you write it in terms of these matrices? What's that? The, the multiplication that transposes. Swap their order. Yeah, yeah. So, so if you, yeah, if you have A B <coughs> transpose, then that's B transpose A transpose, right? Mm -hmm. So <coughs> here that would be what is it? R J I dot transpose of that times R I J transpose of that and so with our notation with the I's and the J's they basically just switch if you take the transpose right uh, so transposing is like taking the inverse of a rotation matrix so uh, really what you're what you're doing is describing the frame that the uh, rotation of J with respect to I as opposed to I with respect to J. So you just basically uh, switch these uh, uh, these superscripts and subscripts around. So you get R dot uh, J I R J I J and so now let's look at this equation again. Uh, so it's kind of cool. This uh, matrix is just this matrix. So we have ij dot and then ji. So really, this is S transpose. So in the end, we have S plus S transpose is zero, or S equals negative S transpose. So that's, that's uh, this sort of reveals the structure of, of this matrix in terms of the derivative, uh, derivatives of that matrix. Um, and so does anybody know what a matrix with this property is called? Skew symmetric. Skew symmetric, right. So, uh, it's not symmetric. Does that what mean this? S equals S transpose. Uh, but it's with the minus here. It's, uh, it means it's skew symmetric. So so let's look at uh, what a skew symmetric matrix looks like. Uh, can I erase this? Yeah. So let's write this S matrix. So uh, just as a reminder, S equals R I J R J I dot. Uh, now I'm just going to write it in terms of the, the elements of that matrix. So S equals S11.
right? And then S transpose, I'm also going to write down just to make it easier. And we have this equation, S equals negative S transpose. So let's first look at the, uh, the diagonal elements. So that's uh, basically this. Mm. Yeah, that's okay. fine. Those three equations, really. Uh, that part of S equals negative S transpose. So we have S11 one one equals negative S11. One one. So the only number for which that uh, equation holds is zero, right? And the same thing goes for the other uh, diagonal elements. So we already know that all of the diagonal elements are zero. Let's get rid of those in our uh, in our matrix. Make those zero. And then we also have uh, S one two equals negative S two one. S13 is negative S31. And then S23 is negative S32. And now we can, uh, how we get to this uh, sort of corner of the matrix uh, S21 is negative S12. But we really already had that was this equation. So that equation is redundant. And then S31 is negative S13, same thing. So we have, we have um, six equations for the off-diagonal elements, but three of them are redundant. So uh, you see that this equation, which I mean, if, it, uh, if there wasn't this redundancy, then there wouldn't be any freedom left, right? Um, but now, because three of the equations are redundant, you still have three degrees of freedom. You can, you can pick, uh, for example, S12. And then, using this equation, you get S21. But you still get to pick S12. If these weren't uh, redundant, then all of them would already be specified, right? So, and those three degrees of freedom are exactly the three degrees of freedom of motion you have in terms of rotation. Um, and now, let me see, I don't get this wrong. All right. So, and this is very much related to angular velocity. Um, so, let me just uh, rename a couple of these things. Uh, so, we have S12. Let's call that. Uh, negative omega z. And then, what should this one be? S21? Yeah. <coughs> and then S13. Let's make that omega y. And this should be negative omega y. Negative omega x, positive omega s. 
So now we have three numbers that we can use to create this S matrix. And then using that S matrix, we can just find the derivative of the rotation matrix by uh, basically pre-multiplying Rji. So uh, Rji times S is just uh, R dot, oops, R dot Ji. So it goes three numbers to this S matrix to derivative of rotation matrix. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the rationale uh, behind the uh, x, y, and z placements of the Yeah, numbers? yeah. I was coming to that. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, at this point, that choice is fairly arbitrary, it seems. But it makes a lot of sense, actually. Because um, it, it has to do with uh, right-handed coordinate systems, basically. Because um, the nice thing is that if you have a vector x in uh, R3, R3, then S times x is the same thing as omega cross x. Make it a curly x, which is the difference. Um, where omega is called the angular velocity vector and is just omega x, omega y, omega z. So that's sort of an important identity. Um, and um, all right, so the, the geometric and interpretation of this angular velocity vector is also important and it's also Part of the reason why uh, you chose we chose these uh, definitions for omega x, omega y, and omega z, um, because the um, the angular velocity vector. So let me draw it like this with the double arrowhead. This is omega. Uh, that can be geometrically interpreted as the axis around which you're instantaneously rotating. So, uh, so if, if this is your base frame, uh, frame J, and uh, you have another frame I, then let me let me just line up this x axis with the z axis of that frame. Mm, sorry, this uh, omega axis. Z. So the uh, if this is I, sorry, if this is J, this is I, then this I frame would be rotating about its Z axis right now. So the X and Y axes are spinning, whereas the Z axis stays in place. Um, and those components are in. Which frame? Uh, those I are J. Uh, those are in uh, body frame, so in J frame. Is that world frame? Uh, no, we were sorry. In I frame, yeah, we were doing I with respect to J. I think the frame doesn't matter as long as omega and x are all both in the same frame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you just need to keep track of in which frame it's expressed, because. Um, well, you need to make sure that frames line up, like frames match. Uh, for example, if you're doing this cross product thing, then you need to make sure that x is expressed in the frame, same frame as omega. Otherwise, the, the result will not make sense, basically. Um, so, but what, what does this omega cross x thing mean, really? It's the velocity where they point at x, exactly. rotating it for us. Uh, rotational velocity omega. Yeah, because, um, okay, let me erase this part. Because if you have, if you have a point, uh, again, so frame J, frame I, and 
try not to think about the translation, but otherwise it's really hard to draw. Um, okay, uh, so if we have if we have a point uh, P fixed in I, uh, then that means that P D T of P in frame I is zero, right? Uh, now, if we want to express this point P in frame J, we have P J is, and again, forget about the translation, rotation 2J from I, P I, and if we take the derivative of this, so we want to determine its velocity, uh, in, in J's frame, PDT uh, P J is well, product rule again, R dot J I P I plus R J I P dot I or PDT P I. But we just determined that since it's fixed in I frame, this is zero. So this is going to go away. But that's not always true. That's that's only if, if that point is fixed in yeah. frame I. Yeah. Um, Rigid body, that's OK. In, in this here. particular yeah. case, it's OK. If you're just looking at how a fixed yeah. uh, body fixed point is moving in a yeah when the frame is rotating. Um, okay, so, but this is this has one of those rotation matrix derivatives in it again, which we don't really like because, well, you have, you're not uh, using as few um, numbers as possible to describe rotation, rotational velocity. So we do this trick and just basically pre-multiply identity. So we have r dot j i p i, and now if we pre-multiply this r i j r j i, so this is this matrix is just identity, so that's fine. We can do that, but now all of a sudden, if we look at this part of it we get our S matrix back. So that's, that's that, uh, uh, so R <laughs> I times <laughs> S times B I. So, and really what that means is that it's, if we use uh, this thing, so S of S times X equals omega, cross x, uh, we get equals r j i times omega cross p i. So that's the velocity of this uh, point that's fixed in i uh, if frame i is rotating with respect to frame j. Um, okay. And now suppose that that point P I is on this rotation axis. So I've I've just uh, stated a couple of minutes ago that it's uh, the geometric interpretation of this omega vector is uh, that it's the instantaneous rotation axis. But now you can actually easily see that because suppose that P is on this uh, on this vector I. It's like along aligned with that vector I. Then what is its cross product? Maybe. Oh, sorry, with uh, omega. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, if P is along this, uh, is aligned with omega, uh, then its velocity is zero, which means that it's on the instantaneous rotation axis. Right? Those points aren't moving. And uh, you can even go so far as to determine what the velocity is. Uh, like the magnitude of velocity based on the distance 
to this uh, 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 instantaneous rotation axis. So if you if you look at the magnitude of dBT. Pj. Then that's the magnitude of Rji times omega cross Pi. Um, and a property of rotation matrices is that they preserve length, right? You can't, by rotating something, you can't all of a sudden get a longer vector. Uh, they stay the same length, so you can just get rid of that rotation matrix. Oh. Omega cross P i. And then... Um, this length of a cross product. There is this uh, identity uh, that says that it's uh, the same as the length of omega times the length of pi uh, times the sine, is it the sine or the cosine? Sine. Sine, yeah. Sine of, oops theta, where theta is the angle between them. So if you look at this pi times sine of theta, then what is that? So I'm, I'm drawing the It's the projection onto yeah. the vector perpendicular to the vector. Yeah, so if you have this omega here, and let, let's just draw p here. Uh, what it is is really the length along this omega vector, right? So that's, because uh, if, you, if you just look at, if, if this is the theta angle, then uh, length of pi times the sine of theta is, is this part. Uh, sorry, is this part, is this part. So it's a distance to the omega vector. So this would be pi sine of theta. So, so you can sort of interpret it as a radius. And if you have this uh, magnitude of the angular velocity vector times the radius, then you get its, its uh, velocity, like its velocity magnitude, right? So the length of the angular velocity vector is also, also has a geometric interpretation as basically the um, the scalar rotational velocity about this angular velocity vector omega. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Omega is expressed in i's frame, i's coordinates, right? Uh, I think all of this requires that i and j have the same origin. Yes. yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. This equation that p j equals r i j p times p i. There's yeah, no exactly. plus displacement. So yeah, the origins have to be. Yeah, I and J are, yeah, the origins are on top of each other, but the coordinates that omega is expressed in are in I's, I's coordinates. In I, yeah, yeah, sorry, maybe I shouldn't apply here. Well, that's okay. Uh, yeah, and the way, the way you can see that also is that um, you have this I here in, in the S matrix and the, the, the three by three rotation vector matrix. Uh, so that means that it's expressed in frame i. And then you actually have to rotate it using a rotation matrix from frame i to frame j to get um, an angular velocity in a different vector, in a different frame. Yeah. 